Myra um, has been teaching math at Los Medanos College for 25 years. She has served as the math department chair, director of the developmental education program, and student learning outcomes assessment coordinator. In 2010, she co-founded the California Acceleration Project, which we heard a little bit about last time, um, with Katie Hearn. And CAP is a faculty-led community college initiative that works to improve transferable math and English completion rates for students placed into remediation and to address equity gaps. And in terms of her background, she got a BA with honors in liberal arts from the UT Austin system and a, a master's of science in pure mathematics from UC Berkeley. Tammy um, has been at, with the California Acceleration Project since 2017. Um, but at Cuyamaca College for over 20 years now and is the math department um, chair there. She received her master's degree in math education and in EDD and educational leadership from San Diego State. So we are very honored to have them here. And for the next two hours, they are going to be giving us um, a few stories and activities. Uh, so if you, uh, we're not going to have an official break, so we are going to have a presentation and then some group work. If you need to step out for bio breaks, uh, please do so during that time. All right. Um, I first wanted to just say that this room is really awkward, right? Um, so I feel very far away from some of you <laughs> and, um, and sad about that. So if you at any point can't hear us um, or the fact that I'm not looking in your direction, it's just the room. Tammy and I are going to be here until 4 o'clock today. So if you would like to talk with us more extensively about things that um, came up for you when we're presenting, we'll be here and willing to do that. Um, part of the reason that we've been asked to present today is that Tammy and I have both led major developmental math education reforms on our campuses. And so we are very aware of and have experienced all the ups and downs that come with major change initiatives. Um, I also wanted to say that in connection with the California Acceleration Project, even though I've been working on that project now for eight years, and Tammy's college was one of our first colleges, and now she has come on as a staff member working with us, um, I wanted to say that the thing we're working on now in the California Acceleration Project is implementing legislation that just got signed this last legislative cycle that is a game changer for placement and remediation in the community college system. So we are also in the throes of working with the 114 California community colleges in a very intensive way to implement top-down mandates, much as you are. <laughs> um, in this two hours, we have structured this into sort of two sections. Um, our, we're not doing our a usual sort of presentation. We are going to have PowerPoint slides, but our focus here is on telling origin stories, sort of how we got started and things that came up as we were working on change initiatives at our individual colleges. That'll take 30 to 40 minutes. Then we're going to have an activity that takes roughly 30 to 40 minutes where we'll have you think about some things. Then we're going to come back for a very short 15 to 20 minute presentation section where we're going to work on implementation stories. So we're going to, we each picked out one or two big bumps that we hit and we'll share those stories then have you think about some implementation issues. Okay. Okay. So let's see if I am coordinated enough to do all of this. Am I Bob? Yes. Okay. Uh, here we are with our contact information, and again, we'll be around today. Um, this is going to be available to you, so you don't need to be taking notes. But I think in any change initiative, you always want to ground yourself clearly in the problem. And so I'm going to just very quickly talk about how um, we view the problem in the California Community Colleges. So when you're look, this is from our Chancellor's Office's website. So this is something that is publicly available, not only statewide data, but by college. These percentages represent the percentage of students 
who completed six units and attempted a math or English course and then went on in six years to complete either a certificate, an associate's degree, or transfer preparedness status. There are 60 transferable units um, finished. Now you can see that they're not the greatest percentages. <laughs> and if a student is labeled underprepared, their likelihood of achieving these longer term metrics is much lower than if a student comes in and we label them prepared. Now unlike the CSU, which has entrance requirements, the community colleges are open access institutions. And when a student comes to the community college, they do go through a placement process at the college. And our placement processes, including our decision rules about how we determine whether you are quote unquote prepared for college and allowed access to college level coursework, depends upon locally determined rules. So there's no consistency across the state in terms of how this decision is made, but you can tell that if you're put into the underprepared category, you have much lower anticipated outcomes. All right, and here's the rub, that in California, historically, we had placed 75%, and some years it's been a little higher, of our students into this underprepared category statewide. All right, now I'm gonna tell you the story of my college when we began to grapple with the low completion data and the fact that we were putting most of our students into remediation and they were having poor outcomes. And so we were asking the kinds of questions that resonate, I think, with the things that motivated the recent CSU executive orders. You know, why are students not completing associate degrees? Why are they not completing transfer requirements? And why do student of colors have, students of color have worse outcomes? Now at my college, this actually was grappled with in an accreditation self-study report. And that led to our academic senate appointing a task force that worked for two years. And at the end of that, we applied based on that report for a Title, five, title III grant, federal grant, that was a $5 million five-year grant, okay? And we received it. But at the premise of the accreditation self-study, the task force report, and the arguments that we made in our grant application was this premise, that students are underprepared for college, and it's this underpreparedness that is the main explanatory factor for why we are seeing poor completion rates. Okay. All right, so at the end of this grant, this is what we had accomplished. And I'm gonna talk you through these interventions very quickly, but they're very common things that I think you probably are doing at your campuses already, or maybe that you're planning on implementing as part of your plan. The first thing that we did is at that time, this was in the late 90s, we did not have standardized placement testing in the community college system. And the first thing that our task force report and our grant work did is said, wow, students are coming in underprepared, that's our premise, and we don't know what they do and don't know. So we need to implement standardized testing to figure that out, okay? And it was mandatory. Curricular changes, we said, wow, algebra is required for everyone. We're gonna put everyone goes through algebra preparation and now they're going through algebra testing and we're finding that 80% of them are placing into the lowest levels of algebra. So what we're gonna do is add another developmental course. We used to have three, then we added another one. So we now had four developmental courses that we put students into. Um, we got rid of self-paced instruction and we replaced it with activity-based and contextualized curriculum. So all of the algebra was now taught through your P&E bill, PG&E bill, buying a car, those kinds of things. And we worked very hard with faculty on teaching in an activity-based way. Student support was embedded into the classroom. We had embedded tutoring. We had special sections of algebra for our Puente program, which is a Hispanic leadership program and our Emoja program, which is targeted at helping African-American students succeed. We also had a counseling partnership with counselors came into the pre-algebra, which is three levels below transfer classes, and worked with students on educational plans, and also they all had a meeting with counselors where they could talk about other issues they were encountering in achieving um, and progressing in their academic work. We did int intensive professional development. So we met every single week. Every single instructor teaching elementary algebra met together. Every single instructor teaching intermediate algebra met together. 
We did things like lesson study around these activities. We wrote common final exams. We used the results from final exams and from intermediate exams to improve the activities we were doing. It was intensive, it was learning focused, it took a lot of our time and energy. And then we implemented an ongoing evaluation um, where we had common final exams, we analyzed student learning outcomes, wrote reports, and we had a research agenda with our institutional research office tracking student outcomes across the program. Okay, I first want to stop and just say, wow, right? I mean, this was the hardest work I have ever done, and I was intensely proud of the work that my department had put into this. Was there resistance? Yes. And I will say, I can top any resistance story you can put on the table, but I'm not going to tell that story now. I will tell it to you at lunch if you'd like to hear it. Okay, but we've dealt with a lot of resistance. All right, now I want to talk about how we started measuring our achievement, and we were in a very pat ourselves on the back kind of mindset. Here's what we saw. We met all of our grant goals. So we had higher algebra success rates across all sections, both in the elementary and intermediate algebra courses. Our success rates went up 10%. We maintained that over three years of the grant. Um, and we were above the state average for the first time since I had worked at the college. Um, we found that students were better prepared for algebra. If you looked at um, success in elementary algebra based on how you got there. If you came through our pre new pre-algebra course, you outperformed everybody else, okay? We had higher persistence rates in the developmental sequence, um, and we correlated this with the counseling interventions. The last thing we did is in the learning outcomes assessment, we had high rates of learning outcomes achievement for most of our learning goals. There were some that were problematic, and we wrote action plans to address those. All right. Whew. Now, do you have, do you know where I'm headed with this? Okay, some of you know me and you know where I'm headed. But wait, but wait. Did these interventions produce higher rates of transfer math completion? Were we measuring the right things? Were we asking the right questions? Now, at that time, there were no, getting data was very difficult. And I think it's harder for you even now than it is for the community colleges because we have the basic skills cohort tracker. It is open access. I can show you how to get there. You can pull up a college. You can pick out a year cohort. You can decide how long you're gonna track that cohort. You can look at where they start and you can see how many of them succeeded in that course, persisted to the next course, succeeded in that course, okay? Really impressive. You can break that down by ethnicity. You can break that down by disability status or e, um, EOPS, which is you know financial. All right, so before we had any of that, I was running the developmental education program, this new program that we were patting ourselves on the back about, and I ordered a pipeline study, which I wanted to know what percentage of the students who started in our elementary algebra course actually completed transfer level math in three years, and I also wanted to know the same thing for students who started in pre-algebra. It took six months for me to get that data back, and you know where I'm going. It sucked. So what we found is that of all the students who had started in elementary algebra who had benefited from that incredibly amazing work, the integrated program that we had created campus-wide, only 17% of them had completed transfer level math in three years. That is terrible, right? And if you looked at students who started in that new course that we were all excited about, pre-algebra, that were outperforming other students in elementary algebra, were they making it to the end goal? No, 6%, okay? Terrible. All right, so the other thing that is very sad is that once I got this whole program into place, it was really hard to dismantle it. All right, so the results of this program, and I'm gonna talk some about my efforts to dismantle it in a minute, but the, this program had produced consistent suck-ass results over time, <laughs> okay? There was a little variability, but it was pretty much flat line ugh, all right? 
All right, so this is one thing I came to understand, and I'm going to share now with you a series of stupiphanies. I call them stupiphanies because they are like stupid realizations that you're banging your head that you didn't realize earlier. The first one is every system is perfectly designed to get the outcomes it gets, right? Our students have not changed that much from year to year, right? And so whatever is happening, we can either say it's due to the students, they're under preparedness, or we can say it might be due to things that are intrinsic to the design of our programs. And that's where I'm going to head now. All right, the first one is, and this is a stupiphany, attrition is inevitable in any sequence. Now, when I first realized this, I was actually working on the SPEC grants, where's Rose? with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and I had a very playful relationship with the Lloyd Bond, who was the researcher for that project. And this was a grant that worked with 11 community colleges. They were all doing really different things. And I said to Lloyd, I think I can predict within five percentage points what percentage of students are completing transfer level math if you just tell me how many la la levers, layers of courses they have in their program. And it worked. In fact, Lloyd published it. So what I did was this very simple mathematical model. I'm going to assume that students have a 70% success rate and a 70% persistence rate across the pipeline. Are you with me? All right. And here's what if you do that. So if you're starting at intermediate algebra one level below, this is 0.7 to the power of 3. 70% pass intermediate algebra, 70% persist to transfer level math, 70% percent um, past transfer level math. With me? Okay. This one, elementary algebra, now I'm going down another layer, so that's adding a success rate and a persistence point, so it's 0.7 to the fifth power. If you're not following, that's okay. But math people, this is simple modeling, right? Look how accurate it is. You see in this column here is my college's data at that time for completion of transfer level math. Here you see the state of California Okay, here you see an achieving the dream study of five states. Okay, now, what is this telling you? Stupiphany number one, the length of the sequence is driving your completion rates. And if you don't shorten that pipeline, which your executive order is forcing you to do, if you don't do that, you will never see improvements in these numbers, period. Okay, now I didn't realize that at the time because what did I do under that? Developmental Education Grant, we added a level. Holy cow. All right, stupiphany number two is that placement is a high stakes decision and we're not very good at determining who's ready for college level work. Now, this was not something I actually had data on, but I was suspicious of it. How is it that 80% of the students coming to the community college are taking a placement test and are put into remediation that is repeating coursework and not just one course, sometimes three courses that they have already passed. Now you know what the prevalent faculty tendency is. Finger pointing, right, it's the high schools, they're not doing their job. But what if we spin that for a moment and say, but wait a minute, how are we making the determination that they're not college ready? And are we confident that we're making accurate determinations there? All right, the first one is that there is a very robust literature now that started in 2012 with a seminal study by Judith Scott Clayton about placement testing. Standardized placement testing has very low predictive validity. You know this, right? And it's actually true for the SAT, ACT also, that these scores do not predict accurately who will and will not do well in, in college and do well in math courses, right? This is sort of shocking, but it's true. In California, we use, over half the colleges use the AccuPlacer test. If you're a math person, that has an R squared value of 4%. 4% of the variability that you see in grades and in, in the course in which students are placed are explained by that test score. Wow. This is bad. All right, with testing, you're always going to have in your placement system error, right? That's natural. 
But the question is, what is the most prevalent type of error that you have, and what are the consequences connected to making that kind of error? So in testing, what Judith Scott Clayton showed, and this has been shown by other studies, is that severe underplacement error. Now this is students who are placed into remediation who by statistical modeling are predicted to make a B or better in a transfer level course if given access, okay? They are severely underplaced, is much more prevalent, and Judith Scott Clayton's modeling, it was three times more prevalent than overplacement error. Overplacement error is when you're put into a course that you're not prepared for. Now those are the students that are obvious to us, right? How many faculty conversations have you had? How many department meetings have you been in where I've got a student in my Calc 1 class who doesn't even know fill in the blank, right? Overplacement is painfully obvious to us and we complain about it, but is it very prevalent? We can probably name three people, right, every semester that we complain about and that, you know, stick in our crock if we feel like they're not ready. Underplacement error is not obvious to us. In fact, those are students in our developmental courses that are doing well and we're taking credit for, them, right? God, I got a great class this semester, got an 80% success rate in my elementary algebra. Should they even have been there, right? Okay. Last thing, and I think some of the, um, at least when I was talking with David, it sounds like starting to really look at high school GPA as an indicator. Now, high school GPA in the studies in the community college system is a much better predictor than the AccuPlacer test of how students will perform in math. Now, why is this? I think it's because high school GPA, this is my now, not research. I think it's because high school GPA is a measure of academic grit. A GPA doesn't tell you what anybody knows, but what does it tell you? That person showed up, they did their work, they figured out what instructor A needed versus instructor B right? Academic grit. All right. This, now I'm still moving on to my stupiphanies. Here's number three, and I think, I think this is the last one I have. All right, this is the most con controversial but the most obvious. Algebra remediation is a bad fit for most students. Now I'm going to speak from the community college perspective, and then we can argue at lunch. <laughs> but if you look at my college, most of our students are not STEM students or business students. What? How can that be? Well, it's true and we know it, right? Most of them are not going into math intensive majors. They're going into all the other wonderful majors in the world. Now, if you look at the mathematics that's required for all those other wonderful majors, it tends to be things like, at least in my college, statistics. They take statistics to meet their quantitative reasoning requirements for the CSU and UC. Statistics, and I teach a lot of statistics, even though that's not my formal training. I retrained because so many of our students take statistics. Requires very little algebra, folks. Now, it does require other serious quantitative reasoning skills, right? You've got to be able to analyze graphs, and that's non-trivial, okay? You've got to be able to make inferences and to understand when those inferences are limited. That's high-level critical thinking. But you do not need to factor polynomials, okay, or even solve equations. All right, so introdu introductory stats at my college was the main pathway for most students, and I will just put this in as a caveat if you want to talk to me, if you want to see if I can trump your faculty resistance stories. My college was involved in the calculus reform movement of the 1990s. Maybe some of you are too young to know about that, but it set the entire United States math education community at war, right? And my college was involved with the Harvard Calculus Consortium in the early piloting of that stuff. So I can talk math wars with you and we can do it. And it even led to legal action at my college. I, <laughs> all right, I digress. All right, now, now that I had these three stupiphanies that are beginning, I'm beginning to understand are connected to research that's coming out right, larger data sets that are beginning to become available. I want to say, and this is something I said to you last time, that the California Acceleration Project, Katie and I, got a very small grant to pay us to do a literature review. And what we were interested in identifying were strategies that would double, triple, quadruple 
completion of transfer level math and English for underprepared students. And we wanted those strategies to close equity gaps. And this is what we found in that lit review. Got to change the placement policies and broaden access to transfer level coursework, right? That goes back to the attrition is inevitable. What's the best way to get rid of attrition? Don't have a pipeline, right? Put everyone into transfer level and figure out how to offer support there, okay? Um, use high school grades and placement and require algebra-based testing and remediation only if you need it. Now, this is controversial and has, I think, earned me uh, if the reputation that I have with people who don't like what I have to say, it's around this issue, right? Whether algebra and how much algebra is needed for everyone. But I think when you say that to the general public or to your colleagues in the English department, they're like, yeah, right, right? We should only be remediating on things that they really need for their program of study. All right, implementing co-requisite models. Um, and Tammy's gonna talk a lot about this and then redesigning remedial courses to accelerate. Does this sound familiar to you? What does it sound like? Your executive orders, this sounds like your executive orders, okay? All right, now I'm gonna tell you this is, I just have two more slides. Um, this one is, I wanna say at my college, and I, like I said, dismantling a program is as hard as building one, maybe even harder, because people work so damn hard to put it into place. Um, and so my college has very slowly been implementing these high leverage strategies that I just talked to you about, placement reform, co-requisites, accelerating remediation and streamlining it. And so I put a little timeline here where you can look at, again, the metric is transfer level math completion in one year, okay? And you can see in 2010, we did, we did not have very good results and African American students were performing worse than others. By 2014, we saw teeny little bumps and we really weren't help, helping African American students. What were we doing during that time? We were replacing the lower levels of remediation with accelerated remedial pathways. We were not broadening access to transfer level work. So we were doing things, we were still offering arithmetic and pre-algebra, but instead of 14 sections of pre-algebra, we were offering six. And we were trying to get more students to take sort of a pre-statistics preparation for statistics, if that made sense for their program of study. Now where you see the big jump in our numbers, and I just got these yesterday from my institutional research office. I had to really beg and cash in some chips. Um, so look at the big jumps we made from last fall, right? Fall of 2016, and what was the big thing that we did? Placement reform, multiple measures placement reform, and we implemented a co-requisite with statistics only, okay? But that's our major pathway in my college. And look at the impact that it had in one year. Okay, and then you can see compared to the state, which just, just makes me wanna cry. All right, so when you look at these rates, even though we had a huge increase, I think we're looking at the right metric now. We're seeing improvement, but this is nothing that I want to stand up in three years and say, gosh, we've sort of flatlined at 45% of our students completing an early trial, you know, milestone to transfer within their first year, it's not good enough, right? Okay. So, last thing I'm gonna say to you is, it, change is a complicated story. I have just pulled out pieces of our change story at my college, but for me, these are the big points. That the data will always highlight a problem for you, but it will not necessarily steer you toward a solution. That your solution strategies will stem from your theories about what's driving the problem. So if originally my college implemented a whole set of strategies because we felt like the problem was students are underprepared and that's explaining low completion. That was our theory, right? And we implemented things based on that. But once we began to shift what we saw as the primary drivers of the problem, it dramatically shifts the kinds of interventions that we're doing. So in a nutshell, examine your assumptions and be open to doing that all along the road. The second one, I already said, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. That big jump we saw in 2016 was not because we suddenly changed the demographics of our student population, that the high school suddenly did an about face. No, what changed was what we did, okay? 
So the, the flat line suck ass rates we were getting for years, in my view now, are directly connected to the way that the program was designed, okay? And the last one is that incremental implementation, the name of do no harm, creates harm, right? My college, by incrementally, slowly doing things over the last, you know, 20 years, or even when we decide to start dismantling our program, which was in around 2010, the rates were so slow in improvement and just the airplane loads of students that we were losing as a result is unacceptable. So I know that you have trepidation and righteous concern about the accelerated pace that you were asked to be making big changes, but I will say that I in some ways wish we had had a similar kick in the butt at my college, right? To really jump in and make big changes because incrementally, I think we did a lot of harm. Okay, on to Tammy. Well, that's really hard to follow. All right, I'm gonna turn on my notes. Give me a moment. Oh, wow, it didn't turn off, okay. So, um, no, that's okay. So I'm Tammy Marshall, I'm the chair of the math department at Cuyamaca College and um, much like Myra has talked about, you know, we, and I'm not gonna go back 20 years, because, but I could, because everything she described is stuff we were doing, right? It's all the same. And also like Myra, by the way, you all are like so far away. <laughs> really weird um, but uh, you know so what we could go back I could go back 20 years but I'm not going to uh, sh everything she pretty much described is is the same we were focused at the course level right that's what we were looking at we were seeing lots of research and and uh, looking at success rates at the course level and they were they were rising and they were looking better but it wasn't until actually until Myra and Katie that we did that same pipeline analysis and we said, holy shit, <laughs> this really sucks. <laughs> and it really was, that was like, it was, it was a stupidity. Like, okay, our, you know, I'm a mathematician. I should have figured that out a long time ago. You know, that 0.7 to the fifth power isn't very good. Uh, and so, you know, and it, we just didn't really think about it that way. We were so focused at that course level. And so, um, you know, but really looking at that pipeline data showed us the true nature of the problem. And then when we disaggregated that data, data, it really showed the problem, right? That there's an equity imperative in this. And that has a lot to do with it. So we can see with this data, and this is similar to what Myra's already shared with you, but um, that community colleges statewide have an issue with placement, that there's structural bi bias and placement is destiny. And of course, this is the biggest issue right here to me is that, you know, not only the 6% at Cuyamaca, by the way, we're only 4%. All right. Across California, more than half of all black and Latinx students that are placed in remediation are at that level. So that means that if we take all of those students, we're basically in a room full of pre-algebra students and we could just look at them and go, you're not gonna make it. We're gonna take your money and you're not gonna go anywhere. And that's what we were doing for years, for 20 years. Sometimes I think back to those 20 years of students that I hurt. And like Myra, I created our fourth level below transfer. She did three, I did fourth. Right? I created that level. I created the test. Right? I did all of that and then I dismantled it. <laughs> and I'm proud to, that I did. So this whole thing really becomes kind of an equity imperative. Um, this just gives you a, um, oh, I went the wrong way. Sorry. Wrong way. This just gives you a visual because sometimes, you know, you see the percentages and then for those non-math people, this really just kind of gives you the visual of there's 100, yes, I actually put 100 people on that slide. There's 100 there, <laughs> count them if you want. And then there's six that walked away. And you know, at Cuyamaca, only four walked away, which made me feel even worse because we were doing really good things and we were seeing our course success levels rise, but that didn't matter, right? So it, whatever was happening wasn't working well. Um, so, uh, like Myra, we started with a pilot, 
uh, we were involved in, as Myra said, the first uh, the first round of summer institutes or year-long institutes where they were instituting the accelerate remediation, which is kind of the first level in that high leverage strategies which is the one that they were focused on. Katie and I were really focused on that for a really long time because that was what they thought was the number one thing that was gonna help students get, get out. And so we also, we got really involved in that and we started looking at data and you know we were, we were kind of like, wow, look at this. This is really impressive, right? I mean, and this is just a, a small number. And so, but what we started to see was the numbers. We started looking at the ends. So, because it was really tiny and we were still, we were still offering pre-algebra and we were still offering, um, at this point we had stopped offering the fourth level below, thank God. But uh, you know, we were still offering pre-algebra, three levels below and two levels below and all of that. But this really, we could see, made a huge difference uh, in our completion rates, uh, at least to that transfer level class, right? And when we looked at completion to degree, certificate and transfer, you know, we were seeing across placement, we were seeing, you know, good, good work. It wasn't great, this is not wonderful, but it's better than it was, but it's still not great. I mean, happy, but not happy, if you will. And then, you know, if we break that out by ethnicity, you know, it's, again, it's better, but it's not great, correct? I mean, the, this is, you know, really kind of what's going on here. So when we, um, when we look at this, when we looked at this at Cuyameca, one of the things that we were doing was we were looking at the, the ends again, the numbers, how many people were we impacting? And it wasn't very many. Uh, we had, in most semesters, two sections of pre-stats. And we had five sections of pre-algebra. So like Myra and like Los Medanos, Cuyameca is the same. 75, 80% of our students are not STEM or business majors. That's not their, they're not going into math intensive degrees. So we started to really kind of ask ourselves, how can we really help this large number of students that we're dealing with? And um, we really wanted, it, we really just wanted to help more students. And, and we weren't just looking though at the 75 and 80 percent. We also wanted to look at those students that came in and were business or STEM, and how can we help them also, right? So we weren't just satisfied with that largest, we wanted to try to help everybody. We wanted to essentially jump off a cliff, which is what we ended up doing. But it was um, Myra and Katie in their research that they did with the higher leverage strategies that really helped us put it all together, right? It was that that really made it sound, um, you know, we wanted to scale this up, we wanted to jump off a cliff, how do we do that, right? And it was those three high leverage strategies that really helped us kind of clarify, if you will, our mission and our purpose. Um, my colleague, Terry Nichols, often tells a story of when she went to this meeting, Myra and Katie, dragged her to, and she's convinced that they knew what they were doing, that they knew her well enough, and I've never asked her, so maybe I'll get an answer. Yeah, they paid for her to go. They didn't pay for anybody else to go. They knew this woman, and, and she, they start talking about the research and the high leverage strategies and you know all that stuff, and then they got everybody in a circle, and they said, Let's go around the room and see what you can do at your college. And Terry, as Terry is, is like, ooh, pick me, pick me, I know the answer. And I think she said it was Katie that picked the person next to her and then went the other way around, right? So she wasn't second. And she's like, everybody else is gonna say the answer before me. And she's listening to everybody's answers and everybody's saying, we're gonna change placement. We're gonna do pre-stats, or we're gonna do this. Everybody's naming like one, maybe two of these things. And she said by the time she got to her, she couldn't believe that nobody had said, we're gonna do all three. But then she said, we're gonna do all three. Now, she hadn't brought this to the department yet, but she did, 
and we looked at the research and we analyzed our data and we'd already been talking about it. So we'd already been talking about the fact that we needed to do something, that the, what we were doing wasn't enough. And we felt like we found our answer. And was there resistance? Yes. I, we never had any legal action thing going on, but we, <laughs> we did have an incredible amount of resistance in our college. Now our department is very small. So we only had six full-time faculty in our department at the time, which was very small. So I always joke and I say, so all we had to do was convince four, right? It's not very hard to convince four. If your faculty is 20, it's a lot harder to convince 11, right? But, um, but you know, there was resistance. There was resistance across the college. We had resistance with our counselors. We had resistance with other faculty. So there was a lot. Um, but we truly believed that students have the capacity to do college level work. And that was really one of our stupiphanies, was that right there, okay? Um, we have another stupiphany, and, and hopefully I'll remember to say it later. I didn't put it in here. So we made transformational change. We changed placement policies, and um, this is actually where one of my big resistance stories is, is in changing placement policies, because we're still working on changing placement policies. I am in a district. I am not a single college district. I have a multi-college district, and we have multi-college, single college, or I'm sorry, we have district placement in our multi-college district, which means that whatever we do, the other college has to do. So if we decide we want to do something, they have to agree with it. So you can imagine the kind of resistance stories I have. Um, we are still working on that, but we have made a lot of changes. And um, Myra always, I think, is nice when she says that we really thought outside the box with this one because we did implement, we call them concurrent enrollment support classes. We didn't call it co-requisites at the time. And I will be honest with you that one of the reasons we didn't call it co-requisites at the time was political. We didn't do it because we were afraid of transfer situations. We were afraid of what was gonna happen, and so we called them concurrent enrollment support. I will tell you that an un unintended consequence of calling them that instead is that students like that name better because they see it as a support class. They don't see it as anything else because we just call it for short support classes. And to them, it's just, oh, the college is giving me support. And so they see that as a positive. So uh, that was kind of an unintended. But we did implement that. And then with our placement policies, what we did is we changed and we used multiple measures to place our students into uh, transfer level classes with support based on those multiple measures. We could not place students into transfer courses without support because in order to do that, our other college had to agree. And they weren't willing to do that. We also said we were going to allow 100% of our students to go into statistics with support, no matter what. Anybody who wanted to could take statistics with support. We didn't change our statistics course. We didn't change the course outline. We didn't change the prerequisites. We did nothing. We just added a support class, and the students were technically, the way it works in the system, placed into the support class, and there's a co-requisite on the course outline of the support class that says, in order to enroll in this class, you have to be enrolled in statistics, right? So that's their way into statistics. And we stopped offering anything below intermediate algebra. We said, we're done. We're not doing it. And this is actually our second stupiphany, and that was students and systems do not do optional. Because if we were gonna continue to offer the, the courses below, trans, below intermediate algebra, students were gonna continue to go in there, and the counselors and everybody else was gonna continue to put students in there. And this was for multiple reasons. Algebra is what's familiar to students, and they think that the familiar is what they want. They don't realize that the familiar may be more difficult than the unfamiliar, right? And in addition, we have a huge number of part-time counselors on our college, and in most of our, the community colleges across the state. And those part-time counselors are counseling at multiple community colleges across the region, and they are, this is what they're used to, right? Is that, you know, you just read the results of the placement test and then you tell the student where they have to go. So if we didn't give them that option, then the counselors had no choice. They had to learn something new 
And we have a, I will tell you this, we have a very close relationship with our counselors. And through this whole thing, we got, we made changes because of issues and things the counselors brought up. We did training with the counselors. Not, not, and when I say training, I don't mean we were always training them. They were training us too. It went both ways, right? So we have a, and, and we've gotten even closer as a result of this movement, as a result of what we've done. We, we work even closer with the counselors now, right? So it's really made a difference. So this is what happened to our access. This is an extremely busy slide, and mathematicians can look at this and go, okay, I get it, and everybody else might look at it and go, oh, I have no idea what that says. But essentially, it says that we close the achievement gap with, re re with, re um, with uh, respect to access, right? Now, um, the middle bar is the percentage of students who place into a business, B is business, business or STEM class with support. Or, or without support, so they place into a business or STEM class directly, right? The one on the left, that is our, um, uh, our original placement. That's what our original placement looked like. And then, of course, 100%, anybody can take stats, right? So that's what the one on the right is. This is placement into transfer level. Yes, so this is placement into a transfer level course. So it says a lot. So... Um, statewide, we, and, and we wanted to start looking at things three years, six years. I'm on our uh, research, I, I work really closely with research at, in our district and in our college, and I'm on this district research team, and they kept looking at, you know, the six-year data, and I, for years I've been arguing with them, why are we looking at data in six years? Because why, we do not want our students to be here for six years, right? And so let's stop looking at six years. Let's start looking at two, three years, and, and let's just stop it there. I mean, and if whatever, we're, if we're not happy with that, then we need to change it. So, so we're gonna look at one year, right? So one year, right, statewide, one year throughput rates for first time math students. Now this is not math students that are in remedial, this is all math students, right? First time in the community college, statewide, any student, no matter where they place, so no matter, even if they place in transfer level, right, it's only 17%. Two year, it's not that much better, it's 29%, right? So what we were able to do, and this is only students, this is one year, in one year, and this is only students who would have, this isn't even all students, this is students who would have previously been in a remedial class, but we allowed them into transfer if they took a support class. 10% is what it used to be. And now we made it 67%. And we're not done because we're not even happy with that. I know some of you might be thinking, you're not happy with that. Well, I'm happy with it, but I think it can be better. And I want to, um, I didn't put this on there, but I want to at least tell you that the overall percentage of success rates amongst our transfer courses for any first-time student is 64%, even if they were placed in transfer. And obviously, that's something else we're working on then, right? Because when we, if we can get this to 67%, and that's at 64, we can rise them all, right? So when we looked at this um, by placement, we can see that, or I'm sorry, yeah, by placement. That's what I said. That's not what I was thinking in my head. <laughs> uh, we can see that you know, for you non-math people, essentially what this, these are the actual percentages on the right-hand side. You can see the actual percentages. So you can see it three or more levels below if that's where they originally would have placed. And because of the fact, by the way, that, so there's a blessing and a curse to the fact that our sister college wouldn't change, is that they still had to take AccuPlacer. And because they still had to take AccuPlacer, we know where they would have placed, right? We know where they would have been. So that's why I mean by a blessing and a curse. And so, um, we can see that before it was there's that four percent I was telling you about right at three le more levels below we got that to 56 percent now obviously I'm not happy with 56 percent but I'm extremely happy with where that is compared to where it was right so essentially what that means is you know at two levels below it was 19 percent now it's 70 percent you know so 
for four bodies below, you know, for four bodies now it's 56 bodies, right? Okay, that kind of thing. And, and the people are the ratio of the percentages, right? So for instance, if one person got out, or if, let's do 10 people at two levels below, if 10 people got out, then but now it's like 37 people, right? So if we look down here and we count all those people, right? Looks like there's 14. So before it was 10 people, now it's 140 people. And then if you look at by placement, it's pretty darn good as well. We have not completely closed this equity gap, but we have certainly narrowed it a lot, right? So before it was six, now it's 55, right? With for black people, for black students, now it was, for Latinx it was 15, now it's 65, right? So when we look at that, right, or one to four, we can look at it different ways. And we raised all boats, right? All boats rose. We expect all boats to rise. But, and we, and we want that to get even better, right? We're not happy. So what are we doing? There's things that we're doing. We're doing more research. We're doing focus groups. We're doing things. What is it that we can do to make this even better than it is right now, right? Why did the students who failed fail? What, what did we not do for them? Right, so we're, we're uh, really happy that we hired Bree Hayes and she's working with the RP group to have some people come down and um, you know, do some focus groups. And so we're really excited about that. So this is what most people ask, well, okay, what about those BSTEM students, right? Because if you're gonna let them in, well, they're not gonna be successful. And while I do expect these students, you know, the percentages to go down a little bit because statistics, you know, this requires algebra and statistics doesn't require as much algebra, right? And, and we're really looking at the same exact cohort for the two years. So the left hand is in two years and the right hand is the pipeline in one year, okay? So we're comparing one years to two years. Um, but still, I mean, look at that. If they normally would have placed one level below, 36% of them got through a BSTEM transfer class. So that's pre-calculus, business calculus, college algebra, um, quantitative reasoning, statistics, or I'm sorry, not statistics, not QR, I apologize. Take all that away. That's pre-calculus, college algebra, and business calculus. Trigonometry might be in there too. And two levels below, obviously, so I don't need to read the percentages to you, 19% to 60%, but still. So it's pretty powerful to me. And then if we look just at statistics, which is where 75 to 80% of our students are, we're doing even more. But they're pretty close actually. They're a lot closer than I expected, I'll be honest. So even I, who was really excited and knew that students had the capacity was still a little, you know, the back of my head was going, oh, how good would those be, right? This is much better than I thought. I'm really happy. So it can work, and I know that it's scary, and what you're going through, I've been through, because we gave ourselves a year to do what we were doing. So I totally understand. Once, once from the time Terry went to Myra's and Katie's uh, presentation to the time that we made the changes, it was a year. And, um, and we did it, and it wasn't easy, I will be honest, and we made a lot of mistakes. And there are a lot of things I can help with with regards to that. We'll talk more about that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that later. So um, should I just? OK. So um, I think one thing that you probably is the biggest takeaway from these kinds of events is it's hard to sit and listen to someone talking a lot. So we take that back to your classroom, right? <laughs> All right, um, we're going to now do an activity together. All right, I'm going to call us back together. <laughs> We're at this point going to stop the team time and focus back up here for just a few more minutes. All right. Okay, in this last half hour together, Timmy and I are going to share what is hopefully going to be very short <laughs> um, implementation stories. 
And then we're going to give you some team time to think about um, sort of longer term problems that you might want to encounter and what kind of data you'd like to collect or request, et cetera. I wanted to say before I started that when Tammy and I walked around the room and looked at the earlier activity you had done before we got here around challenges and opportunities, we felt like we could have written those posters. All right, They resonated very deeply with the things that we have experienced and what we have heard from community colleges. Whoops. All right, so I'm going to tell a single implementation story that, um, and there I could have told a lot. I picked one. <laughs> when we first rolled out our most recent change, which was the implementation of the co-requisite for statistics, so we had a pathway placement for the first time, like students got placed into the STEM path or the statistics path, and then they, um, a lot of them were being placed into statistics plus support. Uh, what happened our first semester of rollout is we canceled 25% of the stats plus co sections due to low enrollment. So this is a really important thing to think about is how you're making sure that the counseling staff, the other staff that interact with students when they first come to the college, right, are getting students into the right math courses. Now, I'm going to go back to my theme that when you notice something, it's your hypotheses that actually drive the way you address it, right? Not necessarily the data itself. So our hypothesis was these classes should have been filled with wait lists, right? Most of our students are going into statistics. We really broadened access. A lot of, most students would have been eligible. So we hypothesized that students were actually still being underplaced in our new system and that they were putting themselves into the wrong pathway for the reasons that Tammy said, that algebra looked familiar, so they were opting to take things that look familiar rather than to land right into statistics. Now, we actually went out and gathered a little bit of data. So we went into every um, pre-algebra and pre-stats class, which would be our lowest levels in the two pathways we have at the college, and we surveyed every student on the first day of class and determined from what they reported that 60% of them should have been placed at a much higher level. 60% of the students should have been either in a, pre, in a stats plus co-rec, directly transfer level with support, or into our one level below compressed algebra if they were in a STEM or business path. Now this is an incredibly high rate of underplacement. Right? This is devastating because we know that if we are placing students into remediation, it dramatically reduces the probability that they're going to complete that early milestone to transfer. All right, so we had the following hypotheses that came from talking with a lot of people on campus. The first thing that we did is we talked with people who work in our assessment center and in our admis in admissions and records office. What they told us is that when the way that things were implemented, when students came in to go through the placement process, they were told they had to have their transcript on them that day. Now, had they been told this ahead of time? No. How many of them actually went and got a transcript and came back to the college and submitted it? Okay not that many, and students were more likely to say, look, I'm already here, I wanna get enrolled, what can I enroll in now without doing that, okay? So this was their theory about what was um, happening. They also, the counseling staff also told us that, of course, there's a lot of fear expressed in the counseling sessions and that students wanna do well. So they wanna do what? Start at the beginning. They wanna start in a class where they think they're going to do well. Um, in addition, the students were just taking a placement survey about multiple measures, how they did in high school, what math courses they took, what their GPA was. They were not taking a test anymore. And there were large numbers, according to our assessment center staff, of students who came in and said, no, you don't understand. I'm bad at math. You can't place me based on that stuff. I want to take a test, and I'm going to prove to you that I'm bad at math. So once they got their AccuPlacer result, what did they do? They followed that instead of their multiple measures placement. All right, so our solutions were to automate placement based on self-reported high school information. And there is a body of research that shows that self-reported high school information has a high level of accuracy. 
but we went ahead and did our own little internal study with random selection of transcripts, um, you know, working with the high schools to get transcripts and making sure that students had accurately self-reported. And if they did not accurately report, they underreported. Okay. Um, all right, so we also tried to increase the face validity of the placement survey. So, and I hope you won't think this is unethical, but we added a bunch of questions that the counselors said they would normally add, ask students, but we didn't use them in determining the placement advisement. So they were questions like, how do you feel about math? When was the last time you took a math class? Have you ever avoided taking math? They were all of these sort of affective, right, attitudinal questions about mathematics. And the whole goal of adding those, we didn't look at the responses to those. Those did not figure into the placement advisement, but they were designed to give students the impression that we were acknowledging their fears, anxieties, and prior, prior experience. All right, now I'm gonna tell you, because again, I'm not at the most functional institution in the world. Um, we did all of these solutions, implemented them, went to every committee meeting that you had to do across you know, counseling, Equal Opportunity, the Triple SP Committee. I, I attended many, many committee meetings to get this into place. And guess what happened? They didn't collect any data. So I have no idea if these solutions were effective. I'm gonna have to look next fall, and we're gonna have to do our, you know, our own placement, our own surveys again in classes to determine if we still have severe underplacement. Okay, so that's my story. Now I'll hand you off to Tammy. Okay, I have a lot of stories, but I'm gonna pick one, <laughs> maybe two, uh, so that we can get you working with uh, your teams again. But one of the, I think the biggest ones for us when we very first started was we were so worried about um, changing student expectations and we really did spent a lot of time on uh, what we were doing with the students in class and working with them on the effective domain and all of these things, and it wasn't that we didn't train faculty, we spent a lot of time training faculty and really working with them, but what we didn't do very well was we didn't change faculty expectations about what was gonna happen in class. And so that first semester, I had faculty in my office crying, it's not working. Um, you know, I had, I had students in my office as well um, even though we were changing student expectations, you know, it, the, I think there were some issues with us. When we, I say faculty, it wasn't just faculty who were teaching, it was also counselors. You know, that kind of, their faculty, so, you know, it was all of that. And so, really, what we did was we said, okay, wait a second, what did we do? And we really had to kind of back up and think about what we did wrong. And we realized that we didn't talk to faculty about the differences and, and what was going to happen and that, when you are putting students who don't feel like they're ready into a class that they don't feel like they're ready for, that you, you do have to change a little bit about what you do in the classroom. And so we worked really hard with our faculty with regards to that. And the next semester I had no faculty in my classroom, in my office crying. And, um, and I had very few students uh, coming to me and talking to me about uh, what was happening. And part of that had to do with when you change faculty expectations with regards to what's gonna happen in the classroom, then they, they can change the student expectations because then they understand what it is. And it isn't that it was all the same faculty from semester one to semester two, because it certainly wasn't. There was a lot of new faculty that we had in semester two. But we just did a much better job of really working with those um, faculty and those students with regards to making sure that they understood what were, what, what did they expect, you know, because you're, I was working with a, a new teacher this semester who is teaching a pre-calculus with support class and she's been teaching pre-calculus for years. And, um, and I had to really make sure she understood that the students she was seeing in the pre-calculus with support class were not the same students she was gonna see in the pre-calculus class. That they were equally capable of doing pre-calculus work, but that they may have fear issues, that they may have um, confidence issues, that there are um, that there are probably maybe a little bit more holes in some of the things that they don't understand, that their grit wasn't maybe as good because their GPA was lower, right? So there were 
there were other things that they were really going to have to um, think about and work through. And and when I sat with her, she was like, okay, okay. And and even then, you know, she's still she's working through it and she's getting it. And you know, and we're still working through this, right? We still don't have all the answers. Um, so and that's that's one of our big ones, you know. And and with that, one of the things we did was um, this. Uh, uh, we had last semester, we were starting like book reviews and article reviews, so that's one of the things we're doing. And we read, what is it, Teaching as a Cultural Activity or something like that by Jim, some of Jim Stigler's research. And we read it and we, uh, all of the faculty read it and then we had conversations about it and we talked a lot about the classroom culture and how it's different here and are we trying to change that and what does that mean and how, what does that mean for us as teachers and overall what does that mean for the students you know because their expectations are different than uh, maybe our own expectations you know we talk a lot about productive struggle but what does that mean to the student and do they really understand how to do that because if they've gone through education and this is, a, I think, a cultural issue across the country, to be honest, is they're not asked to struggle. Struggle is seen as a bad thing, and so they're not asked to struggle. So, you know, the expectations are we talk to the faculty about, you know, you need to make the students struggle, but they don't know how to make the students struggle productively because the students don't know how to struggle productively. So we have to work with the students with regards to that. I know that that was one of my biggest issues when I went to college, when I was working on my math degree, is I didn't know how to struggle productively, right? I didn't know, because I'd never had to do it before. And so I was taking classes and trying really hard to learn. And it wasn't like somebody could sit with me and teach me how to do it, but what I needed was encouragement, right? And so I had teachers that would encourage me. I had teachers who discouraged me as well, but I had teachers that encouraged me, and it was those that I tried to listen to. I'm the rare person because I listened to the ones that encouraged me. And then I looked at the ones who discouraged me, and I said, I'm going to show you. And that's just my personality. But we know that the students we're seeing aren't necessarily those, right? And so.